Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. In commemorating Women's History Month, this year we thought we would highlight developments of a movement in Italy that has not received the attention it readily deserves. Here, I'm speaking to the literary phenomenon of not just immigrant literature in Italy, nor African-Italian literature in more general terms. What we have decided to do was to highlight instead the African-Italian female voice. Our decision stems from the recent publication of an anthology entitled Future, Il Domani Narrato dalle Voci di Oggi, which was edited by the celebrated writer Giabascego and published by FAQ Press in Italy. As George De Stefano stated in his review of our event and his article on the site La Voce di New York, and I quote, Writers long have been agents of social change, exposing societal evils, challenging oppressive orthodoxies, and offering visions of what could be of possibilities latent or emergent. Future, Il Domani Narrato dalle Voci di Oggi, comprises writing by 11 self-identified black Italian women. As the book title suggests, their work is forward-looking while grounded in contemporary realities a tomorrow narrated by the voices of today. The essays are also steeped in Italian history and particularly a past that only recently has begun to be acknowledged, that of Italian empire and its African colonies. The book, the first literary anthology by black Italian women, is a political intervention, an act of resistance to the racism and anti-immigrant attitudes that have become alarmingly widespread in Italian society and politics. Or, as its editor, Ija Bashego puts it, a contemporary jacuzzi that publicly denounces power and injustice. Camilla Hawthorne, Marie Moyes, and Angelica Pesarini are three of the book's contributors who were able to join us on February 4th. We were also joined by Candace Whitney, a New Yorker, who has been writing about racism in Italy and who first brought the book to our attention. Now let's go to the Calandria Institute. Thank you for coming, everyone. I'm so glad uh, that you're all here and that uh, there is a uh, full room and an appetite to learn more about uh, Future. Future is an anthology of uh, 11 racconti or stories written by um, Afro-Italian woman, the editor, is Ijaba Shego. She recruited each of the contributing uh, authors to write about their experiences. And um, in each of the racconti, you're able to learn from each of the women's uh, experiences and also get a sense of uh, the uh, values in a new Italy, a new world uh, that could be um, imagined. And um, Jabba calls it the modern day jacuz by Niozola. Essentially, just how for Niozola, the letter that he wrote uh, was calling out the injustices that he was witnessing, and Future is exactly that. And uh, Future is an extremely important novel, is it? or extremely important anthology, as it's the first anthology written by Afro Italian women. I began to understand my own blackness in Italy. I was born in Northern California in 1987 to an African-American father from Oakland and a white Italian mother from Trescore, Bergamo. My parents, Edward and Giliola, met in Italy in the 1970s where my father had been stationed for military service. They married in the snowy mountains of Trentino in 1976 at a time when there were very few couples like them in Italy. And although they eventually settled in the United States, they insisted that I be raised in an environment where I would learn to value both my African-American roots and my Italian heritage. So I grew up bilingual in English and Italian. I actually spoke in Italian before I spoke English. And I have really fond <laughs> memories of you know, bedtime stories from books of African folklore, African-American history, and you know, favole italiane. I took my first wobbly toddler steps in Italy I have incredibly fond memories of chasing fireflies and collecting elderflowers to make chiropo di sambuco and gathering fresh eggs on my parents, on my, my mother's family farm in Trescore. So as a kid, this kind of transcultural life was pretty banal. 
it was entirely unremarkable to me that I spoke two languages, that I had two passports, that my parents were two colors. But as I grew up, I realized that I was actually really fortunate to be raised by parents like mine and that the rest of the world wasn't quite as open-minded as the family that I came from. So in California, when my mom enrolled me in public school, she wrote on the paperwork that I was bilingual and I was almost put into remedial English classes. My white friends would joke that I wasn't really black until I started outperforming them in school, at which point they claimed that I was receiving special treatment because I was black. In Italy, my mother was often peppered with questions about what African country she adopted me from. When my father and I would go out for coffee together in Italy, we would often notice older Italian men gossiping about us in Italian, but of course they shut up as soon as we switched our conversations into Italian. Per una vita intera sono cresciuta senza avere un passato. Hanno preferito tacerlo piuttosto che consegnarmi un passato nero. Eppure ho ereditato un cognome di origini schiavili. Moïse significa Mosè in francese e il significato etimologico è salvato dalle acque. I remember that when I was a teenage girl and I saw my body turning into a woman's body, I got angry with my white Italian mother for giving me birth with an Italian, a uh, Haitian man, and not with an Italian one, as she did for my sisters, who, unlike me, have Italian surnames, blonde and straight hair. And from that standpoint, the word, my country, was a painful word. The same my father suffered from, failing for her, all his life in attempting to be white. I chose to write this piece because I felt I needed to reopen my patient eyes on him and on our relationship and on the non-white sufferance that connects us. Anche la Maddalena, di circa 18 anni, potrebbe guadagnarsi da vivere perché, oltre ad una buona educazione ed istruzione, è ben addestrata nei lavori di cucito e ricamo, abile assai nell'arte culinaria, brava nel disimpegno di tutte le faccende domestiche. The letter is written by the Vicariato Apostolico di, uh, di Asmara, uh, dating 21st of May 1931. Somehow through um, my education I uh, came to term with, with myself and so for the first time I went to Eritrea and I wanted to work on the oral history of women. So I really wanted to gather uh, the voices of women who were born during the fascist regime uh, from white, usually fascist fathers and African mothers, like in my family. The question where I'm from in, in my case is also more complicated because uh, my parents are both mixed and my grandparents are both mixed and so my family history originated in Italian colonialism. I was born in Rome, uh, but I was raised in Reggio Emilia, Pianura Padana, and I remember my childhood as a fantastic period of my life. Also a period where I was uh, surrounded and sometimes drowning a bit in the ocean of whiteness, because nobody was like me uh, ever. Um, from the moment I was stepping outside my house, uh, everyone was white, everywhere. So from kindergarten to almost university, I never had a non-white um, student in my class. It was always me. <laughs> In addition to the book presentation, we sat down with the three contributors and then with Candace Whitney. We joined them now at the Calandra Institute. Welcome to Italics. Tell us who you are, what your background is, which will tell us why you're here. Okay. <laughs> I'm Haitian Italian. Okay. And I'm a PhD student in political philosophy right now. 
Uh, these days, I explain myself as Italo Afroamericana. So, mm -hmm. my father is a Black American from Oakland. My mother is Italian from Trescore near Bergamo. Um, and now I teach in the sociology department at UC Santa Cruz, um, and I teach classes on uh, race and blackness in Europe and citizenship, and uh, writing a book about black youth politics in Italy. I was born in Rome, and I live in Florence, and I am a professor at NYU Florence, where I teach a course called Black Italia, and I define myself as a black Italian woman. So I have origins in the Horn of Africa, yeah. but uh, for me it was really important to highlight uh, blackness and Italianness. When I first saw the title, I was really intrigued by it because I was looking at it not only from an Italian point of view, linguistically, but also from an American point of view, and I don't know if that play of words is there. Future, of course, would be, uh, for those who don't know Italian, future voices, so it makes sense that it would be future or future women, right? What, uh, there are a number of play of words also, but I was wondering about future. That is the English. I really sort of thought about that, you know, and of course that's my own sort of semiotic, as we would say, right? That does that. But but really, future il domani raccontato dalle voci di oggi, I think is really important. The, the, the idea of temporality and the idea of, quote unquote, moving forward. Not that we ignore the past, but we build off of it in a sense and we move forward. So we don't just complain about what happened, but we look at what happened and we try to learn from that. That's sort of what I see from this book. E. Jabba Shego wrote a nota del curatore, that is the editor's note, who unfortunately couldn't be with us here, fortunately for her, because a new book of hers came out, and she's traveling around Italy presenting that. And then you, Camilla, wrote the prefazione. This, I thought, was just so um, outstanding in its significance, that you write, in Italia, dove ho veramente iniziato a capire cosa significa essere nera. It's in Italy where I truly understood what it means to be black. Yeah, but you had to go to Italy. I did, and you know, actually when, um, when several of us were out at dinner last night, you know, I said it's, it's really when I'm in spaces with other black Italian women, and I define that in a very capacious mm -hmm. sense, where I really feel both my most black and also my most Italian. And so even though I was, you know, I was born in the United States and I went to school in the United States, as I mentioned in the preface, um, so my mother was the only one of her family who came to the U.S. and I was born with Italian citizenship because of Italy's particular citizenship right. laws. So I spent large chunks of my childhood in Italy with my Italian family. And because of, you know, this sort of bizarre combination of being you know, a dual citizen, African-American, also first gen, you know, child of an immigrant, all of these things. Um, there were ways in which I felt that my own lived experience of blackness didn't quite map perfectly onto the kind of uh, normative narrative of what it means to be black in the United States. And this was something that I always sort of struggled with, right? Not feeling sort of properly black in a, again, in a very narrowly defined African-American sense, but also going to Italy and not being recognized as Italian. And things really started to change for me in 2016 when I lived in Italy for a full calendar year doing the ethnographic <coughs> research for my book. Um, you know, when I met a number of other black Italians, right? We are all black Italians by different routes and routes, but there was something about the kinds of hyphenations of our own identities and certain kinds of narrations of lived experience, even though, you know, again, the geographies were quite different, but there were just places where I began to understand my own blackness a lot mm -hmm. more and really helped me to sort of you know, something that I now do in my work, which is to really ask, you know, how do we shift our center of gravity when we talk about blackness, right? Understanding the historical, political significance of the black American experience, but also trying to understand Italy as this incredibly generative site of, you know, black diasporic knowledge production and cultural production as well. So for Marie and Angelica, you have a different African uh, quote-unquote experience, right? When people were asking me as a child, where are you from? It was always a bit complicated for me to respond because I knew I was Italian, but I couldn't understand uh, well the origin of my color. Also because my parents didn't help me 
with that. So I had to find all the answers by myself. And so I was, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, color blindness, children see color very well. So I was aware of being Italian, but also non-white. And so I was questioned a lot about my uh, identity with this famous, infamous question, like, where are you really from? Because Rome was never enough for, you know, even questions about my perfect Italian. Wow, what did you learn? <laughs> and so, you know, always these questions, yeah. very invasive and very um, unreciprocated. And so I had to reckon with my blackness and my Italians for a long time. And then I managed to go to Eritrea for the first time as an adult. And then when I went there, many things suddenly made sense to me. It was really a very important uh, journey. And uh, now I have to go, I would like to go to Somalia because it's the other side of right. my family, but at the moment I think still mm. not possible. A and yours instead are also, quote unquote, North American to some degree, Caribbean. Yeah, and actually, as I, as I wrote, um, I have always perceived myself as white and I have always perceived my, my father as white too, because uh, he's mixed, <laughs> he's mixed too, and my, my grandfather is mixed too, <laughs> so my family too is a, is a mixed family in a lot of sense, but uh, what, what happened to my family is that after the migration from Haiti to Italy, they started acting like full Italians cutting their roots, cutting their relation to Haiti. So I started making a lot of questions about my family's past without receiving any answers. And that caused me <laughs> a difficulty in my identification because I felt uh, Italian, but uh, every time there was something that reminded me I was not completely. Uh, Italian, Italian as it is expected to be so my my surname is <laughs> so complicated to pronounce right. my uh, first name is French um, and so on so my theme is a complicated relation with with w Italian whiteness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there's an, another story that marked me a lot uh, which I discovered recently it concerns also Italianness and Italian citizenship which is a great theme in, in my family's uh, history because, you know, my grandmother uh, married my Haitian grandfather, but my grandmother is Italian. And when she married my grandfather, she lost her Italian citizenship according to the Italian oh. citizenship oh. law. And, and when did they get married? They got married in the 50s, 50s, and until 75 in Italy there was a law which obliged women to lose Italian citizenship uh, if they dared to, to marry, marry. <laughs> a, a strange, uh, yeah, yeah, a, a strange foreigner. One. Yeah. All this mix of migration, incomplete whiteness, incomplete Italianness uh, is my mix. And that's, this is why, what, what I try to, to understand, to analyze here. And your experience also is your history or your family history is also one of colonialism and, and so on and so forth. And there's a, I mean, and there's, a, there's an Italian connect, I mean, Italian yeah. colonialism, obviously, yeah. but then Columbus and Hispaniola exactly. yeah. 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 as well yes. Yes. Yeah. Is, part of, yeah. is part of your there's story. This, there's this first yeah. so. sign called Italy that's always there, right? But this is how the stories are really intertwined, especially right. I noticed Maria's and my story. Mm -hmm. there are, when I was reading her story, I had the feeling she was really reading my heart. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the things she wrote, the feelings that, you express, that she expressed in her, in her story were exactly what I was experiencing. So reading her story was very powerful. The phrase that sticks out from your writing is i bambini metici, and in yours is il malessere di chi non è. And just that sense of really sort of disappearing, or at least your Haitian slash African part just disappeared. It disappeared for you. You had to, you had to literally rediscover it. Yeah, and I did it 
thanks to an important um, reading, which is Franz Fanon text. The work of Franz Fanon really let me understand what was going on inside me mm -hmm. and inside my family, because he gave a name to the psychological consequences of racism, which has really affected my family. And concepts like colonial trauma uh, is are fundamental to understand what, what happened to me, to, to my family, and to understand racism, I think, mm -hmm. as, as a world. But il malessere di chi non è is something that I started to name uh, like that, thanks to Fanon. It's really difficult to name something that um, has not a, a specific word in, in the Italian language. Yeah. We still have to invent a lot of word to name the racism experiences because Italian as a language has a colonial history and we have to understand that in order to expand this language, I think. Mm -hmm. I like the way you divided up your work and you talk about actually the Haitian syndrome which I had never heard that. I don't know if it's something that you had coined, whatever, but I had never heard of the Haitian syndrome. <laughs> you know, but I guess it's part, it's the malessere di chi non è. Yes. Yeah, and I like your documents. So it's a real story, actually. Yeah. So I have to say, when we were asked to write a story for this book, I thought I gathered so many important stories that somehow my story could be told through the stories of other women I, I had the chance to um, conduct interview with. But the one I talked here, I think I like to call Madalena the first Futura, mm, mm -hmm. because she's the first one of us. She was a mixed girl. Uh, her father was not as bad as many other Italian father because he was paying for her uh, institution, but he disappeared. And so she, she doesn't know, she doesn't know where she come from, where, where are her parents. And so for her it's very difficult to deal with her identity and she also live in an institution of violence and oppression because the orphanages where uh, these uh, mixed girls, mixed boys were raised were incredibly embedded in racist and fascist uh, violence, uh, physical and psychological. So yeah. there was a lot of colonial and post-colonial trauma that probably has been transmitted generational also to our parents because you were talking about the questions. I also was asking many questions to my mother especially and there was always a, a silence, a very heavy silence and all, just as an adult I realized that was the pain. She experienced being raised in, in a very uh, difficult and hostile environment that she didn't want me to have any of that and so the best solution was for me to be just Italian but obviously it's not possible mm. so yeah. yeah, almost 20 years ago, there was a fairly significant book that was print, published in Italy called Lorda, Quando gli Albanese eravamo noi. And it was already late in, in certain ways because there was already an African immigration to Italy, right? You, uh, Camilla, wrote about a double consciousness. Mm -hmm. And by Du Bois, his notion of double consciousness, he's dealing with the African American, whatever. And Fanon, actually, also in Black Skin, White Masks, writes about dealing with two systems of reference. So yeah. you see that in Fanon yeah. as well. Yeah. Right. And also the idea of border. You then also talk about border consciousness. And, yeah. and, and your story really uh, seems to undergird or bolster this double consciousness. You had to cross a border, whether it is psychological, whether it is emotional, sentimental, etc. You know, first, factually, you had to dig up the facts, right? Yeah. You had to find out what went on in Haiti. And so I wonder if we can talk about the turning point being 1996, when we had the first non-white Miss Italia, mm. Danny Mendez. Mendez. The Italians were scandalized mm. when that happened. And if that's sort of that first step, mm -hmm. which then helps in some way maybe pave or at least the first sort of shuffles to furrow this path, you know. You know, the 90s are really a really interesting time to think with, right? Because we have Denny Mendez. And then very shortly thereafter, we have the murder of Jerry Maslow. Yes. And then immediately after that, we have the passage of the Legge Martelli, right? Italy's first comprehensive immigration law. And then two years after that, we have a reform of Italian citizenship law. And so it, it's complicated because we, 
you know, we see almost a kind of dialectic process where, I mean, again, right, when I was doing some, you know, archival research for my book on citizenship and I, you know, dug up this article that, you know, someone says, you know, there was a time when citizenship was a very straightforward manner and now with all this diversity, it's much more complex. And the reality is that Italianness has always been an open-ended <laughs> question, right? We know this, but at the same time, I think, the, the fragility, right, of this thing called Italianita, which no one can actually define except, right. you know, in relation to what doesn't fit within it. Um, really, we see that really beginning to kind of be ripped apart at the seams in the 80s in really generative ways, right, but at the same time sort of matched by these moments of backlash. So I think we have to sort of t tell the Denny Mendez story alongside the story of Jerry Maslow, right, the mm -hmm. South African mm -hmm. asylum seeker who was, who was murdered and <laughs> whose death was actually used as a justification for the passage of this first immigration law. That all of these things are happening, right? We see the enactment of stricter uh, laws governing you know, who can become an Italian citizen that make it harder for immigrants and their children, easier for descendants of Italians in diaspora, right. where there's almost this kind of doubling down on uh, sort of uh, a very racialized, but also very class-based understanding of who counts as legitimate Italian. Yeah. Um, and we're still, you know, we're still in the wake of that moment of the 90s. I mean, like you said, these questions aren't new, but the political rhetoric of emergency and newness, right? is still being put to you know nefarious use the whole issue of the recuperation of citizenship of Italian descendants that really has its roots in fascism. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize that, that it was a very, very young Mirko Travaglio who wanted to, while well, he was part of the fascist regime, who wanted to do that and was a whole. You know, it's interesting to think that uh, Italy had to deal with black children being Italian mm -hmm. since 1909. Mm -hmm. So we always think right. about the fascists, but already in the liberal, liberal nell'età yeah. liberale, mm -hmm. the colonial government has to think about it because there are so many mixed race children yeah. indigent in the streets and so they they start thinking how what do we do with this mass of Italians and so it's there that uh, anthropology comes in the picture because the criteria is blood so they say if the child shows signs of Italian blood then it can get Italian citizenship so uh, this is the thing we always talk about uh, like if it is a very new problem but it's not this connection with race and identity and Italian is, is, yeah. is very old. I mean, hypo descent, you know, and we can even look at like Costa paintings from Latin America, right? Where, you know, even if someone, you know, was one, you know, one sixteenth, one thirty second, one sixty fourth on these, you know, you would still see, right, you know, a, the drawing of a black mole, right, to indicate this unerasable stain of blackness. Yeah. No, but Angelica is absolutely right. And this is why her work is so important because she's also. Right, challenging the idea that this is something that we can trace to fascism, but it really goes to the heart of liberalism. And the fact that Italy was unifying as it was beginning to colonize, and that it, there were these two, right, there was the problem of the South that was always being understood in relation to the African colonies. So these really complicated geographical circuits of race thinking that go back to, you know, the middle, late 19th yeah. century. Well, there's that horrible expression that people have used in Italy over it's a good century and a half since it's been, and that is Afro begins from Rome. No, l'Africa comes to the Rome and Jew, right? Afro begins from Rome and below, right? Some people take it as high linguistically, there's what's called <laughs> la linea spezia. Some people take it as high as, <laughs> as maybe, you know, that far up. I don't know. But yeah, you're right. The, the Southern question is all intertwined with this, and they weren't able to get over the Southern question. How are they going to? deal with African immigration, right? Whether it's Northern or Sub-Saharan um, immigration. Si cominciò soprattutto all'estero a guardare con interesse a questi libri che da più parti venivano definiti collettivamente letteratura migrante. It began basically above all from abroad. People started to look at these books with interest, which were basically called migrant literature and if you are born and raised in Italy regardless of what your color is it's not migrant literature right mm -hmm. <laughs> our friend Amara Lacus it's migrant literature but our friend Pap Kuma it's migrant literature right 
But if you're born and raised in Italy, it's not migrant literature. And that also was an issue. Some, and it's interesting that from abroad, that Lestero, because one of the people who's a friend of the Institute, a friend of ours, is Graziella Parati. She started in the 90s, late 90s, dealing with, quote unquote, migration literature in Italy, dealing with Africans who were coming to Italy and writing in Italian, the one, such as a Papkuma and that generation there. And there was an Italian critic who I thought really well with this, Armando Nishi. I don't know if you know his work. Yeah. And eventually he says, forget about it. Let's just call it literatura in italiano. It's all Italian literature. And he just looks at it linguistically. And that's hopefully is our futuro diverso. I think the power of the language yeah. here is crucial because very often, as I was saying earlier, we are questioned about our Italian, mm -hmm. but then we use Italian to show our Italianness. Yes. And so it's really interesting how we can use this uh, tool and this weapon uh, that yeah. was imposed uh, on, on the colonies. Yeah. For example, yeah. I remember some people telling me how it was forbidden to speak the language of the mother. Mm, there was serious physical yeah. punishment if you were heard speaking Tigrinya or Somali. But, and so Italian was imposed this language of the father, but now it's interesting how Italian can be reclaimed mm -hmm. to show an anti-colonial resistance mm -hmm. in a way. I confronted my experience with other um, Afro-Italian <laughs> people and uh, in several families they forgot the other languages mm -hmm. and in my case Italian was imposed by my Italian speaking mother to my father, but I think that the imposition of the language still a phenomenon in these new, <laughs> new <laughs> uh, Italian families, and and this creates at the same time Italian as the weapon who um, questioned the Italianness, mm -hmm. but at the same time the problem to find the world to to do this work. Yeah. yeah. There's an uncanny analogy here, and it's an analogy. It's not, I'm, I'm, by no means am I putting them on the same level, even though the Italian immigrant in this country at the beginning of the 20th century went through some pretty horrible things. I think there are two groups, if it, whatever we want to call them, two ethnicities, have really suffered more atrocities than others, and that is basically the African hyphenate and the Jew hyphenate, or the hyphenate Jew, depending on where they are, with, of course, genocide in the case of Jews, but also indirect, gen indirect and direct genocide through slavery, of course, of the African, and so. And actual so, genocides that took place on the African yeah, continent. Right, mm -hmm. right. But, but it's uncanny that there are these analogies, loss of language. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in the Italian case, was the desire, the second generation sort of made sure that they didn't learn, some of them didn't learn language in some cases. It was apparent, but it was also a dialect that was involved. And I wonder what it was like to grow up among the so-called uh, quote unquote Italians, you know, my, and let me open a parenthesis here, my colleague Joe Shora and another friend of ours on the West Coast, Laura Ruberto, did a book on new Italian migrations. Do you know? Mm -hmm. do you know I the, know Laura really yeah, well. New Italian migrations, two volumes. One is history and politics and the other one is art and culture. And in the first volume, they talk about the notion of real Italians, which is something that, of course, you guys uh, go through as well, right? And it's the Italian born and educated in Italy who come to the United States and talk about what's real Italians and not real Italians. There's this false category, this arbitrary category called real. You know, I have to say, I have my own kind of bizarre entree into this because, so, you know, my mother came to the U.S. in the 70s. And so because she was sort of, she had a very different kind of experience than the kind of typical Italian-American you know, experience. Um, I grew up speaking Italian before I spoke English. You know, my mom sure. only spoke to me in Italian. And then I went to school on the East Coast in Rhode Island, and I remember someone saying, "You're gonna, you're gonna love Providence. Huge Italian community. You have to go to was it Federal Federal, Federal Hill? Hill?" And I show up to Federal Hill, and I walk around, and I'm like, "What? I don't understand anything they're saying. They're not." And I caught myself. 
they're not real Italians, <laughs> right? And oh, this was very confusing yeah. for me because also, you know, kind of San Francisco Italian American culture is also very distinct very from East yes. Coast. So I had, a, yes. you know, double culture shock. But you know, it's interesting this question of language and real Italians because you know, you know, what it means to use a language transgressively is something that I think we also see in the use solely citizenship movement in Italy, mm -hmm. right, where you have. You know, this generation of young people of color, including many people of African, you know, young people of African descent, but between, you know, what is it, 800,000 and a million young people who are disenfranchised by Italy's right. citizenship laws. And they're fighting back against a xenophobic public that says, no matter what, you will always be immigrants. And they're saying, you know, look, we're actually, we're, we're just as Italian as you are. We speak language, we speak dialect, we have this cultural knowledge. And as a political strategy, it's, it's, it's astute and it's really sharp and it's very subversive. And at the same time, it opens up all these really complicated questions about, you know, actually, what is this thing called Italianness? Yeah. You know, yeah. because even in trying to contest it, we're reproducing it in different ways. And yeah. so the question, you know, it's a broader question, again, of how to think, you know, kind of a border consciousness where we don't have to make an appeal to that category at all. Yeah. You know? yeah. But it's it's so complex. Yeah. You say you, you teach black Italia. So what do you teach? What, is, it, is it sort of a potpourri or are you doing something in lit, something in film, something in um, so, more social science? Yeah, it was conceived as a course because um, from New York they realized that students going to Florence, they went with this ideal mm, Florence, gelato, pizza, arte, Dante, and then they arrive in Florence and they experience racism, homophobia, sexism, and so there was a big shock, especially in terms of race and word being told uh, very often. And, uh, and so they thought it was important maybe to create a course that could give um, the vocabulary and the knowledge to explain mm -hmm. this racialized uh, history. And so we start from scientific racism of the 1800s and we end up in 2018 Lampedusa. So we really go, it's a long course, it's 14 weeks. So yeah, we start from uh, the Gobineau and the Aryan debate. We go through colonialism a lot. Uh, interestingly, I take the students to Rome to see the heritage of the fascist monuments uh -huh. because, you know, we have a number of shocking fascist monuments completely decontextualized. There is nothing, especially in Rome, I think, well, uh, I think about the hour, <laughs> we go to hour, but Obelisco Mussolini, that is something yes. inconceivable in, in, in the rest of Europe. Why is there so uncontextualized? So yeah, we go through colonialism, but then we also, I also try to really give them a, a hint of today. And so we talk a lot about immigration laws, Lega, Casa Pound, uh, shooting in Macerata, uh, police brutality, and, uh, racial violence in Italy. And so it's important for them to see uh, similarities, but also massive differences mm -hmm. in how race is uh, uh, performed uh, in yeah. Europe and, and in Italy. So that's why we're trying to develop this concept of black Europe is so important because although the US is a, it helped us a lot, we also noticed that we are very different and this yeah. is important to, to be um, highlighted. Ijaba always stresses how resistant is the Italian editoria to publish uh, this kind of books written by non-white Italians. So right. she says it has been a, an incredible difficult struggle for us to, to break this wall and still it's very, it's very thick. There still reigns the notion of the real Italian mm -hmm. and the real Italian can't oh. be the African Italian, can't be the Italian uh, Argentinian who writes in Italian and wants to publish in Italy, you know, and so on and so forth. They may be able to publish sometimes, but within that notion of the literary mm -hmm. canon, they're not recognized. It goes back to 1885, literature written in the Italian language, but it does has not ever really just been quote unquote Italian literature. Mm -hmm. Always has some sort of label to it and so on and so forth, and, and it's the same thing. We've got to get to that point where it's just Italian literature. Oh, by the way, it's also African-Italian. And know? I'd say, on the other hand, Afro-Italian, or, or rather black Italian, are not neither uh, sufficiently black in mm -hmm. order to be published as black authors. Mm -hmm. Because? Because they speak Italian. So as an anti-racist activist, what, what I see is that often there is a 
standardization of uh, the black person in Italy, which is can be accepted only as a refugee just landed on the Italian coast, while if <laughs> there's a, a black Italian speaking Italian taking the floor, uh, and there's something in the stereotype of the black person who mm, crash. And I think we have another, a, a another problem there because there's also a, a way to, to struggle against mm. racism in Italy, which is quite problematic, actually, because we often uh, see white anti-racist context looking for the protagonism of black people. And mm. actually, what we are saying with this book is these people are already there. Mm -hmm. They already speak. Uh, the fact yeah. is, the problem is that who is listening. Who's listening? Who's reading? So they are, uh, we, they are asking mm -hmm. to white Italian people to leave the space right. in literature, mm -hmm. in politics and so mm -hmm. on. And that's a problem. It's a problem of power. And I think that that's why, you know, when we look at this kind of fluorescence of, you know, black Italian politics and cultural production, it's happened in all of these alternative spaces, right? Through, you know, independent literature, independent film, you know, social media has played a huge role yeah. because, you know, people have become so fed up with the kind of um, the patronizing tone of political organizing in these more traditional spaces, like the political political parties like the labor unions. And so people have sort of started to create these alternative spaces of autonomy, right? These are our voices, these are our stories, you know, we're not going to package it into, you know, a nice sympathetic narrative, right, that sort of absolves you white Italians of any of your guilt because, you know, mm -hmm. you don't want to be accused of racism. Yeah. And so I think that's, yeah. that's why, you know, some amazing things have really been happening precisely because people are saying, you know, we're not going to wait to be represented. Yeah. The press is, FAQ in Florence, and it's a young press, young couple that are publishing some very interesting slash significant books, I think, really creating to a, a national discussion. You prefer black Italian, don't you? I don't perceive myself as an, a black Italian, actually. I, I name myself okay. as an Afro-Italian. Afro. Italian. Afro. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's more black Italian. Yeah. 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 You. Yeah. And you? It depends yeah. on the context and who I'm yeah. with. It's always shifting. Yeah. But in Italy, I'll say black Italian. So even terminology becomes significant and and problematic, right? And there's a lot of debate, you know, on yeah. the ground in these communities in Italy about, yeah. you know, the terms of self-identification. Yeah. Well, so, there was here know. in the United States. Absolutely. You know, I want to thank you guys for coming, thank you. and thank you. we're going to continue this conversation. Thank Good. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Candice, welcome to Italics. Thank you. So you wrote a review of the book Future, Il Domani Narrato dalle Voci di Oggi, and you wrote it on a, for a website called The Dreaming Machine. It's a wonderful website that is bilingual, bicultural, and it was uh, basically set up by a dear friend of ours, Pina Piccolo, who's yes. now living in Italy. Yes, so Pina um, reached out to me um, about writing a review for um, Future as well as a translation. And we, in general, have been speaking on, a, some, on a topics related to um, Afro-Italians and um, immigration and citizenship in Italy. And um, I had the great opportunity of reading the book and just writing this uh, review that really goes deep into each of the 11 racconti or stories um, to really just give uh, the reader a, an assaggio del percorso, a yeah. taste of the journey throughout right. the book. You're responsible. It's your glory for <laughs> for our friends from Italy being here. It's great that uh, this is the debut presentation of Futura outside of the U.S., especially only so few months after its first publication. Yeah. It's a great uh, book to build a, the ponte fra le diaspora, or bridge between the diasporas. Yeah. Um, as an African-American woman, as Camilla had shared, as an African-American Italian woman. And um, it's really important that these dialogues take place, because there's so much to learn from Afro-Italian women, 
just as Camilla had written in her preface. And your own experience, because you're, you're Candace Whitney. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no vowel at the end of your name. You're not of Italian origin, but you lived in Italy. You did your junior year abroad, then you went back and lived. You had a fellowship, you had a Fulbright, was it? Yes. So you've spent yes. some time in Italy as an African-American mm -hmm. woman. Yeah, similarly to Camilla, I also really started to experience race and racism in Italy, different from what I've experienced um, in the U.S., um, definitely much more nuanced. I think I was very uh, struck by um, just the visibility of racism. Um, one example that comes to mind is um, with the, the Venditori Ambulanti, or when people um, will ask you, yes, you know, how um, well do, you know, come mai parli italiano così bene. Um, and even though I'm an American woman experiencing that in my mind, I was like, how can that be if you're born and raised here or, you know, you're, you've grown up here your whole life and you received that question. And then also in just more subtle senses, I'm naming neighborhoods after Italian colonies, such as Cirenaica. I lived in the zona Cirenaica okay. of Bologna. Um, and that is something where it's significantly more subtle um, with the relationship to colonialism um, in Italy when you don't know what Cirenaica mm. means yeah. or it's not openly spoken about. Mm -hmm. Your interest in Italy goes back to your undergraduate days where you were a double major, anthropology and Italian. Yeah. And you're studying Italian, and I'm assuming you're reading Dante, Petrarca, Boccaccio, Leopardi, and so on and so forth. And then you go to Italy, and you see another side of Italian culture, right? Well, so yes, I studied in anthropology and Italian at Mount Holyoke College. I studied with Ambretta Frau, Morena Sfaldi, uh, Enrico Moretti, and um, they're their courses were fabulous because they really focused on bringing students to contemporary Italy and what took place. So in my lessons, I remember during the periods of elections, we would follow the elections. We would um, watch films um, as well. So we did a lot more of contemporary Italy. And I remember just wondering, um, especially when we were following the elections, what must it be like to live there when I would see um, blackness and immigration be so objectified in tools during um, political elections. It just made me really curious and um, it made me want to go to Italy and learn more and that's really where a lot of this uh, interest uh, stems from. Yeah. So I actually met Pina Piccolo and um, Camilla Hawthorne the same night. We were at an event um, specifically um, related to migration a few years ago. And um, Pina and I were in similar circles and um, a professor at the University of Bologna had um, let us know that we were both going to be at the event. And then um, with Camilla, I had learned at the event about her research and I was like, we, I'm studying something very uh, similar we met during um, my Fulbright year. So yeah. I was uh, researching um, businesses owned by African women and how personhood impacted oh. their uh, marketing strategies and things like that. So when I learned about Camilla's research, it really resonated with the project I was working on. Is that project still in the works? Is there, I feel like it's are always we going in the, to see something? I feel like it's always in the works. I uh -huh. wrote um, numerous articles throughout yeah. my experience and I've posted those on uh, my website. And this is businesses owned by African women in Italy. Yes, and um, the Fabulous. topic I, I uh, expanded on it in relation to citizenship yeah. um, and just other projects by immigrants or Italian youth that focused on immigrants or non-white Italians. But I feel as if the project is still always here and I'm always working on it, uh -huh. even with bringing together yeah. this event. So this brings up a question of identity to a certain extent, because especially if, if five years from now we're sitting here and you're still doing the same thing, then we have to talk about identity and who you are, right? Because um, we've gone beyond biology being the deciding factor for mm -hmm. identity, right? I mean, it's a social construct. And so now your involvement in Italy, I mean, we might just have to hyphenate you and call you an Italian American or an African Italian, depending on our perspective. I mean, you've really invested in Italy. Yeah, there's a lot of Italy within my daily practices. Yeah. Um, you know, enjoying, uh, you know, a cafe, and, um, yeah. you know, to yeah. enjoy that or, you know, 
when I eat, I like to just eat. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, there, I I do identify still as African American. Sure. And like I said before, I really view my interest as uh, just building that bridge between the diasporas and bringing out what we can all um, learn from each uh -huh. other and. I do feel as if that in terms of uh, race studies, there is a privilege coming from the U.S., especially as an African-American yeah. woman. And it's really important to um, learn from the histories yeah. of uh, scholars and women who um, are also part of the African diaspora. And there are just so many similarities um, as well as differences. Um, it was amazing to listen to just the different relationships with blackness or Afro between Marie, uh, Camilla, and, uh, and Angelica. Angelica. Yeah. And then same with just learning about um, when Marie shared about the citizenship law and how her mother had lost her citizenship when she married her father. There's a book coming out called Dixie's Italians. Mm -hmm. And it, I don't know if you've seen the reference to it. It's brand new, it's coming out from a Southern press. And it's about the Italians in, in the South in the Jim Crow era. And there's a chapter in there about miscegenation and how there's this person from out, this, this African-American man from Alabama who is first tried and found guilty because he's quote unquote marries a white woman or quote unquote white woman. And then he appeals and he's absolved because she was Sicilian origin. Mm. And therefore, I forget now how it's stated, but something, to the, and therefore it could not be proven to be white or something mm -hmm. to that effect. It was very interesting. Oh, yeah. yeah. But that whole issue, you, you know, that I think Italian Americans of, of today have somehow forgotten or they never learned about it. Definitely. That part of the history. Yeah. I think uh, connecting those histories is really important um, for um, community building, knowledge building. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, like we've been saying, you know, they can't be forgotten. So now you're translating, you're engaged yes. in a project <laughs> yes. of translation? Yes. Um, so I've started translating this anthology. It started with the first translation published on uh, the Dreaming uh, Machine. Okay. Um, and um, so now I'm working on the rest of uh, the anthology. What's available on the Dreaming Machine is La Maratona Continua, or The Marathon Continues, by Addis Tesfamari. That's good. So eventually this will be available? Yes. Yeah? Uh, yes. That is, that is the plan. Um, so just reading, writing, reading, writing, yeah. editing. No, because it's important. I mean, I think, you know, the, the conversation we just witnessed was really enlightening. I mean, it's complicated enough being a hyphenated American, whatever, than when you're in a society that, in spite of the Southern question, um, North-South has always considered itself at least as a collective consciousness, mm -hmm. as quote-unquote white. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden there are over a million Africans of different generations running around Italy. You know, it's like, uh-oh, wait a second. Returning to translation, I do think yeah. there's an appetite for this type of um, anthology. Um, Ultra Babylonia, Beyond Babylon, was recently translated. Uh, that was one of Ijaba Shego's first books and recently was shortlisted for a pen translation prize. And just with that book, it, um, it goes across the diasporas from yeah. uh, Argentina, Italy, Africa. So there's a lot, um, I think in general, there's an appetite yeah. and curiosity for it. And that's the other issue you just mentioned, that it goes all over. It's not yes. just the United States, not just North America, or in Marie's case, the Caribbean, but it's actually other parts of America. And we actually have dealt with that in Italian American studies. We, at one point, we sort of caught ourselves and said, well, maybe this term Italian American has to be enlarged, has to yeah. be a much larger term. And we have to go from the North Pole to the South yes. Pole. Yeah, I mean, even for this um, anthology, the beauty of it is it uh, features the voices of women from across the peninsula. For example, Jada Khan, she's based um, or was born and raised in uh, Naples um, mm. in a small town outside of this. So um, it's great to learn the experiences of women um, from across the peninsula, not just, let's say, northern Italy mm -hmm. as well, um, yeah. because there are just nuances in every uh, region and city. Yeah. I've written another article on um, the dreaming machine that unpacks uh, privilege in Italy. And I was taking that from a stance as an African-American okay. woman, mm -hmm. but really more like what can I take a step back from and um, learn about colorblindness in Italy and what can be 
what types of discourses can we um, have in Italian? So um, I write about different privileges from race, gender, um, language as well. It's really important yeah. to leverage that yeah. um, privilege and build those, these conversations. Thank you Thank for staying you. with us. Thank you. Thanks for watching this episode of Italics. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata.